Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition of the Wrestling Underground Podcast. I'm your host, as always, Chad Porto. Joining me is the glorious one himself, Mark Screen. Marcus, how the heck are you? Well, man, another Tuesday coming off of a really good show uh, last week. Looking to do a repeat. So we got two shows this week to re- recap for you. Uh, we're not going to spend too much time with Backlash. Um, because while the crowd was amazing, I thought the show was not. Marcus, did you enjoy Backlash? Did it live up to the fan attention that it got? Yeah, I man, I think just to see that that crowd reaction, you know, WWE's, uh, you know, they do go abroad. Uh, but specifically over the last however many years, it's been uh, very honed in towards... Uh, the Middle East, if you will, of course, with their Saudi show. So, uh, but obviously there's a clear intention to branch out uh, more as they basically be hitting a bunch of spots now between France and then they could be doing different places after this. But uh, in terms of the show straight up and down, just to see that crowd the way that they were, just that felt like a, a whole other show in itself, the France crowd. Yeah, I thought it uh, thought it was entertaining down there for that alone. It had some interesting entertaining stuff throughout the night as well in terms of matches but in terms of an overall show i could see how this could be easily kind of forgettable as the year continues on yeah i didn't enjoy the matches as much as some people um in fact i would say up until the main event i thought they were all pretty bad Mm. Uh, at least for the expectations uh some things have become very clear to me uh jay uso and jimmy uso are not good singles wrestlers (laughs) Yeah. I don't know if it's Jay because, like, the current common denominator in these really big matches that fail is Jay. Maybe Jimmy's better. I don't know. But the last two big time bouts, you know, WrestleMania and now Backlash France, Jay has put on a clunker of a match. Now, you like Damian Priest, so I, I, I respect that. I don't like Damian Priest. I don't see him very highly as a worker or as a personality. Mm. I just see mid-card Damian. (laughs) But it could have been an issue with Jay having some bad matches because the people he's with. You know, I think Jay had... Did Jay have a match with AJ Styles that people were talking about? With AJ Styles? No. Jay had a match in early 2024, I think. That people were raving about on on Raw, I think. But I have was it Gunther. Well, it, so if it was Gunther, it it, it does kind of prove the point. Gunther's probably the best worker in the world right now. You know, m- maybe not by a large margin, because you know I think Swerve's up there. He's yeah. pretty damn good. Um, Alexander's up there. He's pretty damn good. Uh, obviously Okada, but like. Yeah, Osprey. Yeah, Osprey. But, like, you know, some of these guys, you know, <laughs> when you work with them, you expect to have good matches. I feel yeah. like Jay's not the main eventer people want him to be. But here's yeah. the other thing. I want to like the bloodline. I really do. Mm. I adore Tama Tonga. I think, I, right? Like, he's Samoan Sting. Like, he's athletic. He moves well. He's powerful. He's quick. He's, he's everything you want in a wrestler. Um, but the one thing I, I, I have to say is is Solo Sokoa is not a good good worker. He's fine. You know, he can get the job done, but his aura and mystique is pretty bad still. Like, he, he hasn't won since, like, 1942. Yeah. I know he's winning tag matches now and everything, but like, he, he was decimated by the way they booked the bloodline. Yeah, that's 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 a lot. Of, clearly, a lot of the reason why they got him in this position now, because he very much was the, he was the pin taker for the bloodline. While you know everything was leading up to uh, the whole uh, finish the story situation, so he kind of needs this um, kind of separation of, of assertion, if you will, since he was touted during that whole time to be the next tribal chief. I guess this is him trying kind of getting out the gate a little early, if you will. But uh, in terms of your point about Jay, I get it. 
and I was thinking about it because we brought up the conversation talking about Mania, about the match with, with him and Jimmy just didn't hit. And he said in an interview that they got they got cut on time. And I was thinking to myself, I'm like, it wasn't, like, I understand that. And obviously, you can get more stuff in and, and you know, try to facilitate more reactions and intensity and whatever. But ultimately, the foundation for the spark of that division between the two of them has to come in a larger context of the bloodline. That match doesn't work on its own because none of the rest of the bloodline is involved in it. So you don't really have that deep emotional connection. Like, I mean, people see Brothers Beef all the time. It's definitely not the first time it's happened in WWE. And we talked about, like, they had a better video package leading into the match than the actual match that itself. Also, you have the point of the only difference between the two of them is a move. Uh, Jay, Jay do the spear now. That's it. Like, everything else, they got the same exact move set. It's, so. it's very hard to book twins apart. I think that's what we're seeing in that regard because you're right. They don't have a lot of unique personalities on their own. One wears green, one wears blue, like, or red. Yeah. It's like, oh, okay, cool. You're different shades of a Christmas tree. Dope. Yeah. And to me, the spark will come in when, because this is easy to see ahead as, as a, you know, so proper for as long as they run on TV. Clearly, there's going to be a thing where they're going to have to, you're going to have to rally back with his brother whenever he comes back. And Roman's going to be that linchpin. And the, to me, the, the emotional reaction that they probably wanted from the match they had at Mania is going to come when they get back together. But to your point, that's the thing. They work better together. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of happened to, you know, with Bully Ray and TNA kind of felt like an anomaly. But to be fair, he put the work in. He dropped weight. He got in great shape. And that Bully character, I mean, it's, it really wasn't that far of a departure from who he is, so it really worked. Um, <coughs> but, yeah, you don't really see that happen a lot of times. We saw, this, you know, obviously the hardest had their own stuff, but I just don't necessarily think it's going to work with the Usos. Like, they trying their damnedest with Jay, and the crowd is into his music. Um, but, yeah, they just it's just one of those situations where they're better together. I think when you look at um, Matt and Jeff and, and Bully Ray, I think w w the thing that you nailed it on the head was uh, they, uh, they, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I'm, I'm trying to work two mice's, mouses at the same time. The Hardys and Bully both put in the effort to be different characters. Jeff really engaged with his, like, especially like with the Will of the Wisp character, which I think if Jeff does leave AEW, and stops over in TNA, I would like to see him do that because it, it's a less demanding role. But you look at Matt, like, he really committed to going bonkers. And, and that, like, that broken Matt gimmick not only uh, brought forth one of the greatest characters of, of, the, of the last 10 years because it was used in three different promotions, it kept one alive, it, it brought hype beyond hype to another, um... Yeah, like that that was substantial. Like that was a huge sw shift in character. Like if if Jay were to shave his head, call himself, you know, the the mob master or some something stupid, just like goes completely ham, right? Like divided Jay Uso, <laughs> and starts like painting like arrows on his face or some nonsense, and only talked in backward rhymes. He might get over. Like he needs to go wide. Like, he's just, he's still just Jay. He's one half of the Uso. That's still what he feels like, looks like, and vibes like. And now, yeah, I think the, the end game right now is a reunion, but if the end games are or the reunion, then the singles push will never work because I feel like that's why Team 3D failed in the WWE in 2002 because they knew that they would always bring the uh, Team 3D back together somehow. So they didn't let Bubba Ray become anything other than Bubba Ray. Um, and, and I think they tried to keep that kind of spot warm a spike. And I really do think that they had more faith in Devon as a single star than Bubba because Devon got the gimmick. He was a preacher. He, he had Batista's Deacon Batista. So I feel like the Usos just aren't destined for greatness because they won't let them 
truly expand past their, their current shtick. Um, and that brings us back to the bloodline, though, because it's not like this is a very mid stable and it needs to be said. Now, Paul Heyman is doing the best he can to put it over. And Tomatonga, anyone sleeping on Tomatonga needs to wake the fuck up. That being said, we were all very excited for the stable, not because of Solo Sokoa, but because of Tomatonga and the possibility of Jacob Fatu, who is just the craziest motherfucker you could ever see. Now, we have to deal with Tama Tonga as the leader, and now Tonga Loa, who is about as impressive as a fart in church. He blew his first spot in the, back with the company. I, he crawled out of the ring late. <laughs> Thank God for that rip. Right? So, like... Yeah, we're already off to an auspicious start. The problem is, is that WWE fans have have embraced this idea that the WWE is hitting on all cylinders like it never has before, and it just hasn't. It, it it's good. It's better than it's been in years. Yeah, but it's not great. It's far from it. We've seen far better wrestling in the last. I shouldn't say twenty years because that's probably not true anymore. But we've seen better wrestling uh, from this company recent within the last twenty years. Um, I think a lot of people are very hyped on the Cody Rhodes of it all, and that's for good reason. He had a, a banger with Styles, but for the rest of it, like I, I, you know, Bianca and Jade won the tag belts. That's cool, but it wasn't a great match. Although I saw some someone on Twitter got real real mad, broke his TV, and everyone left. And I'm just like, he, what, what, why are you that mad that Kabuki Warriors lost a belt that doesn't have any meaning? Like, I'm actually a little excited. I'm not a big Jade fan, but like Bianca and Jade are getting pushed to the moon. This may actually help the women's tag team division, which has sucked up until now. We, we talked about how, the, how it's been with those, the history with those belts, what they've ultimately not meant, despite uh, a projected narrative. Um, we know, so we talked about on last show, the situation with Jade. The, 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 one of the best things they could have did for her was tag up, put her with Bianca. She's going to get a lot of uh, help both in and out of the ring. Um, with her helping her, uh, certainly with the matches and, and covering up a lot of her weaknesses, but also navigating that WWE system. That's a completely different thing than what she was doing in AEW, both from a uh, presentation, frequency of presentation, and as well as travel. So that's the whole thing. Uh, in terms of the match, uh, God bless everybody in it. It was it, it got ass to a point like it it, it it and I and I like Jay love Bianca rooting for them tremendously but it got to the point where like you could and we we I promise we gonna get better at editing we could put the clip up of Jay towards the end of that match and then have somebody the over going where's the ball where's the ball like she was really trying to find it. And it, I was just like, yo, uh, get Bianca back in there now. Like, so she still got some stuff to figure out. It felt like she felt that way towards the end of the match when they won. Like, she know kind of what it looked like. So, but like I said, she's going to hopefully get better, um, aided by Bianca, of course. Um, I also felt like there was some miscommunication between the referee and, and one of the Kabuki Warriors. But, yeah, hopefully... They keep them tag titles on them for a while, help build up that division, like you said, get more frequency and, and uh, treatment of these tag teams. And just overall elevate, the, like you said, the division and specifically those belts. So, um, But in terms of tossing stuff at the TV, so many of these flat scans are over-invested. There's no way I'm going to F up my own equipment over something that's predetermined. You trip. Yeah, you're not. Really uh, one of the things I want to point out is that a lot of guys I'm starting to see, like I think Sokoa qualifies, uh, Tiffany Stratton qualifies, Jade qualifies, are being pushed from NXT too fast. I, I, I don't see a lot of excitement. Like Tiffany Stratton really held back that match with Naomi and Bailey. And I've never really been a big fan of either other woman in this match, but like you could tell Tiffany Stratton's not on their level. Hmm. She might be one day, but I feel like when you push somebody this fast, when they're this green. Interesting. 
I feel it holds them back, even if they get better. The perception it remains. Because you notice, know because you're an athlete, uh, how much of her obviously brilliant athleticism is helped covering that greenness? A lot. Yeah. That and her look. Yeah. If it's she didn't, if she didn't look that way and didn't hit like, and she hits a beautiful BME, like fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, if she didn't look that good and move that well on the ropes, I I, I feel like me I wouldn't I wouldn't see how they could call her up this soon. It's a bit quick. Um, any other thoughts on backlash? Uh, it was cool to see. Uh, like you said, uh, Cody and, and Styles had a had a banger towards the end. Of again, it's it's uh, AJ Styles probably the best shape he's in of his career. It feels like, which is saying a lot. Um, and, and Cody, you know, is is he always rises to the occasion, man, hitting that uh that crazy, uh, kind of avalanche Cody cutter, if you will. Uh, so they delivered to And like I said, the French crowd was incredible. Probably enhanced a lot of the moments that that uh would have been letdowns because just the, that that type of energy they was able to keep throughout that whole show is is nuts. But uh, yeah. You know, they got some interesting stuff coming out for that. Obviously, we're entering at least King of the Ring, King and Queen of the Rings. But uh, Backlash was fine. It was a fine show. Yeah, and the crowd definitely made it better. Uh, the one thing I will say is uh, a lot of people are like, oh, yeah, you know, highest gate ever. And, yeah, it was. It was the highest non-arena gate or non-open air stadium or whatever it was. Uh, in history of the company. But tickets for like $600 for nosebleeds. And here's the other thing that cracks me up is they basically got all this off in net profit. The the country of France paid for them to come. <laughs> it's the same idea for like how uh, Australia brought in TNA, how uh, their sports tourism board is the one bringing them in. So like that to me is funny that people are kind of ignoring that fact because it kind of does paint the situation a little bit differently. Um, they don't need to be taking France's money to be showing up. If they can generate, I don't even know, what was it, $12 million, $14 million, $16 million off of one show? And again, it was just one show. They made a lot of money the entire weekend they were there. They don't need to be taking France's money. But that kind of leads us into the second part of this France debacle. It wasn't the debacle. The shows were actually very well received. Uh, but there was a whole Triple H... Um, press conference on Sunday after Backlash where Triple H just decides to start trashing uh, news outlets because he can and everyone's like yeah and somebody on Twitter pointed out to me goes you know the IWC really rehabilitated this jackass's career he's a very mid booker (laughs) doesn't really have that much creativity in his fingers and, and, and a lot of people think he does but he ends up having some of these really bad storylines and and like he, he's not a good he, he's a bad talent scout carrying cross being exhibit one through 26 dude's been fired more times than i can count he keeps coming back because triple h likes him um but during the news conference he uh somebody asked a question about uh the release of drew gulak who we'll probably touch on next week and the uh, the whole thing was like you know we haven't released him, his contract expired, and then he uh, dunked on PW Insider and Fightful. <laughs> and then apparently Sean Ross Sapp had some issues with that, and Mike, he was, he's the head of Fightful, and Mike Johnson had issues with that, and so did uh, Dave Shear. Uh, neither of, of those last two men I have any respect for. <laughs> but it was just kind of one of those situations where I he showed his ass again. Like, he deliberately, maliciously, and callously buried two outlets that have done very well in praising Triple H. And it just reminded me of all the, the, the douchebaggery that this man has not only caused, but has allowed to be caused underneath his reign. And it's just kind of one of the situations where I hate the internet wrestling community because they've, they've ignored or forgotten about the turmoil and trauma this man has allowed to reign, not just as a wrestler, but now as an executive. It's just like... When are we going to wake up and realize that he's not a good person? It doesn't matter, Chad. As long as they're getting what they want. Yeah. <laughs> it, could literally, it could literally be Homelander 
And they were like, it's the Homelander era. <laughs> I'm honest. I, so, like, I did the, uh, the, the photo for tonight for the show is Danny Green from his infamous We Let Him Off the Hook. And I, I slapped the IWC logo on his face and, and I put Triple H in the corner. I'm like, he was who we thought we was. We let him off the hook. But the idea of Triple H's Homelander is basically a one to one comparison that I think is very apropos because he is not a good person. And people still celebrate this moron as if he was someone worth celebrating. You and, know and he I'll... knows what Vince did. Like, we don't have evidence that he did, that he knew, but we know. How do you not? I'm working that closely with him, and then obviously he's your father. And like, you have to have some inkling or have seen something of, even if he distanced himself away from it, you, you was aware of it and didn't say nothing. He had to have known. How can you not? How can you not know someone that intimately for that long? And not always going on. But, but also, let's just point out how Triple H even got into the situation to begin with. Dude was dating Joni Lauer, Ch- China. Cheated on her with Stephanie. Then Stephanie and Triple H gaslit China and then got her fired. She, top, she was maybe a top ten draw in the company at the time. They wouldn't give her a, a comparable uh, contract worthy of, of her station. Why not? Yeah, her it's downfall, her 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 entire just suction, uh, the whirlpool. Right to, yeah, right to that moment to finding out that her love of her life was cheating on her with the boss's daughter, and then the company conspired. Not I shouldn't say, say conspired because that implies that they they were doing things behind the scenes uh, to to move things. They were, they were just saying, hey, don't resign her. Hey, don't give her a raise. It wasn't even a, cons- a conspiracy. It was just them working really kind of paints that whole family terribly. It's, it's weird, too. so now, many other things. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, 100% right. It's crazy, too, because in this particular era, they would never let somebody like her go. No. And and I think the saddest part is, is like, if TNA was in a better place, if they could afford to bring her in, I think they could have salvaged a lot of her career. I think they could have probably kept her away from going into the adult entertainment, uh, probably kept her away from doing the drugs that she did that ultimately ended her life. Maybe yeah. even uh, helped her not fall into a relationship with Sean Waltman, who was equally as uh, um, addicted as she was. I just think the whole family is a miserable sack of shit, personally. Yes, yeah, it's, it's just weird because we had this conversation a while back when when the, the transition was happening from from Vince to Triple H, and we talked about it like the internet is, you know, having all these uh, unnecessary orgasms because they're comparing simple logic to what Vince was doing, mm-hmm. which was making guys like Karrion Cross look like BS Ninja Turtle villains. And the back and forth, fifty-fifty booking, and the start and stop pushes all the high hell. Like anybody could have could have came off like a genius during that time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But you know, it's it's just it's just one of those things. People, you know, they they wanna they want buy narratives. They want a bandwagon to jump on, and it's just you know the simple things that get them narrow. You're not wrong. All right, let's uh, move on to Ric Flair. Uh, Speaking of why we're on the phone with douchebags and uh, weirdos. Yeah, a little bit. So, Ric Flair kind of caused a hub of oil, if you will, a couple nights ago, maybe two nights ago. Uh, He got kicked out of a... Is it a Florida pizzeria or something like that? North Carolina? It doesn't matter. He, he got kicked out of a pizzeria because he was drunk. And he lambasted the, the entire pizzeria online saying, uh, I got kicked out because I took issue with the kitchen manager being in the bathroom too long, which already is a weird thing, right? That's already a weird thing. Then somebody said no. They were like a... a 
what were they, a manager at another location in the same area, and they said, no, he, they were told that Ric Flair was drunk and belligerent and got thrown out because of that. <clears throat> the general manager of the store then said, well, you know, we're not going to touch on it, but Ric Flair was asked to leave. And then video came out today of Ric Flair belligerently abusing <laughs> all these kitchen folks who, who, who are just trying to do their job. He's challenged them to a fight. <laughs> 73 years old. The dude just admitted to having a real heart attack in his last match. Like, come the fuck on. But um, the funniest part about this was as he's drunk and screaming and wooing and, and insulting and dropping uh, uh, insults and, and derogatory terms, he goes, ah, let's go outside and fight. And the guy's like, I'm not going outside to fight. I don't want to lose my job. And the patron just goes, I'll go outside and fight you. And then Rick Flair's like, what What'd you say? <laughs> And, like, he kept trying to keep the bass in his voice, but when he realized that at 73 he might actually have to fight someone, he calmed the fuck down. <laughs> but it's just, it's one of those things, man, like Hulk Hogan, Ric Flair, like, they're the same, different sides of the same coin, man. They, they just lie through their teeth every chance they get. Ugh. And I want to say I'm disappointed, right? But Ric Flair's cheated on every wife he's ever had. Right? He's skipped out of work for, for really just pathetic reasons. He, he's held people up for money. He's largely been a terrible human being. But just like a Triple H, we look past it because a hero fucking. Some people just want to wanna just believe that their heroes are who they thought they were. <laughs> and they let him off the hook. I like that. That was unintended, but I like that I brought it around. Uh, Marcus, I mean, I, I, are you even surprised at this point that Flair's doing Flair things? Oh man, he's gonna die with the gimmick. Um, that's just basically what it is, man. Like we talk, you know, that's that's built, that's been his whole life narrative for the longest. Like that that line between Reed Flair and 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 you know the Nature Boy got blurred a long time ago, and it's, I, don't, I don't think it's going back. Gene is not going back in the bottle, um, and and the more success he he garners financially, there's really not going to be a need. That you know, uh, he's been through a lot in his life both in and out of the ring and you know obviously i think he's still in a significant and this is by no means excusing any of his effort effery in terms of his behavior um because that that's not a new thing but i think he is also partially and i think a lot of reason why he still dives into the bottle is because he's still in a heavy amount of grief behind his son you know so you know, I think it's a lot of contributing factor, but I think foundationally he's just, he's a lush. He's a lush, and he has spent a lot coming off of his hype, and he has spent even more buying into it for however many, what, 76 years, I have old he is? So, he's uh, uh, spent a lot of time with his own head up his up his rear, <laughs> and it, that, it, it becomes very apparent when he drinks, and kudos to that. <laughs> that guy at the bar for for maintaining his cool and whatnot. Uh, the whole my family came here. My family goes here, and he he really. I was surprised. He literally said everything, but do you know who I am? And who knows? He may have. It just may not have been recorded. Um, yeah. There's a part of me that wants to to believe that this is still grief over his son, right? Um, but his drinking has always been prolific. You know, like, he was flashing stewardesses on, on the plane ride from hell. Yeah. So, like, clearly his drinking is, is not just off of the back of his, his Reed's death. Uh, the one thing, though, is I will point out, he was told to quit drinking a few years ago because it nearly killed him. And yet he still does it. So... That's the unfortunate nature with that. Uh, we lastly, but not so much lastly, because there, there's quite a lot to go through. Uh, under siege. Um, I don't want to, you know, I'll, if I have a main right, if I have a, a main promotion, it's TNA. That doesn't mean yeah. that I'm blinded by them. Under siege was mostly an unnecessary show. There were a few standout moments, but there was twelve matches, including three on the pre-show and I didn't feel like more than three of them were worth tuning in for 
Um, Rhino defeated VSK. At the same time, when Rhino was on the pre-show, there was a photo of him helping Becky Lynch twirl her hair. I'm like, did, did Rhino leave the company and join up at, as a producer? It must have been in the yeah. old photo. <laughs> I'm about to say that was real. I'm, yeah, I'm like, well, what? Because I'm thinking somebody photoshopped it. I'm like, what in the blue hell is Ronald doing helping the Irish lash kicker? Um, yeah, it had to be an old photo. Just had to be. Because he was, he was on the card. <laughs> I saw him with my own two eyes. Um, he defeated uh, VSK, who is, uh, I don't know if he's back with the company, but he's working with the company again. Uh, the FBI, who is Ray Jazz and Zach Clayton. And Zach Clayton was apparently a, who? Someone on Jersey Shore? Is that who he is? He's married to JWoww, apparently. Uh, he's fine. I don't think he's, he's bad. Uh, Guido, though, is, is the only reason I care about them. <laughs> Ray Jazz, I think, is his nephew. So uh, They defeated the Batiri, uh, Oberion and Kodama. Former Shikara stars. Now, I, I theorized at the last show that we had another set of Shikara stars, namely The Whisperer, uh, to close out the uh, pre-show portion of the show. So it's good to see some of these Shikara guys getting booked again because even though... What was his name? I want to say Mikey Whipwreck. That ain't right, though. Quackenbush. Even though Quackenbush wasn't exactly the best person he was a hell of a trainer and he produced a lot of great talent so it's good to see some of these guys still getting another shot i'd like to see dasher hatfield and uh what's his name uh, mark inglesetti get another shot especially in tnr i think there's a lot of room for them uh laredo kid retained the exhibition title and no, i'm sorry the digital media title by defeating casey navarro uh, there was a big shake-up on the show with hammerstone being pulled due to an, un, uh, met, an, an undisclosed medical illness or medical situation, I shouldn't say illness. Uh, I think Laredo Kid was supposed to face... Was it Joe... Jake something? <clears throat> I want to say it was supposed to be Jake something. Uh, or Rich Swan. I can't remember. You know, Swan faced off with something. Yeah, I'm saying who Laredo Kid was supposed to face off with. Oh, gotcha. gotcha. Uh, I want to say it was supposed to be Jake something. Maybe it was Swan, one of the two. But they ended up switching up the, uh, the card a bit, and they booked Swan versus something. Uh, oh, it's supposed to be Jake something versus Hammerstone, so I think it's supposed to be Swan versus Laredo Kid. I think that's what it was. Um, so Laredo Kid got the win. Solid pre-show. Uh, then we get the... It was a, a, hell, a heck of a match, but I'm surprised it went on first. It was Alexander and Eric Young taking on Macklin and Frank Kazarian. I like this tag match. It was good. And I wouldn't mind seeing these two cats go forward. I would actually like to see Young and Kazarian kind of, you know, I know they, they were a tag team for like a, a brief moment in time, but that's where I would like to have seen them go because I think the tag team division could use some guys like that. Uh, solid opener. Um, any thoughts so far on the on the show as, as it was? I dig it. I like what Swan and... and, and uh... Francis is doing um, him and him and uh, something on uh, a hell of a contrast. That's interesting. Um, like you said, great opener with the you know Alexander and, and, and folk. Love to see more of that. Love this whole thing. You know, Cass got going with the being the king of TNA, which is not that far off if you know the history. Uh, and yeah, like you said, they switched a couple things up. But these were some I, I think. If for nothing else, some very interesting matchups uh, down the line. Uh, in particular, a return to a man I feel like we've been calling for for a year and a half now to get some significant amount of uh, attention, if you will. So. Mm -hmm. okay. We also had Ash Valley against Speed Havoc. Uh, Joe Henry defeated Zachary Wins. Joe Henry's on a bit of a... He's having a moment. His song is top five in the UK charts right now, his entrance theme. And I think <clears throat> while he didn't beat Taylor Swift, he does have a top spot over Beyonce. Or at least did for a point. So, like, pro wrestling fans are, are coming for Joe Hendry in the best way possible. And it's making me think, and, and not too 
shockingly, because I've been big on Henry. I think Henry might be the guy that you push for Simon Rush or Bonfilor to win the title. Because I don't see anyone on this roster that you can really make into a new star that could carry the company. Henry's got the look, the skills, the, the, the mic, just the general vibe. People love him. He could be the next thing that could take TNA to the next level. <clears throat> so... His win over Zachary Wentz I, 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 was a nice uh, was a nice setup for hopefully more to come. He's a, he's a, he's not he's not one of those little guys that's really good. He's kind of like um, like we always talk about Gresham, but like imagine if Gresham had his size, mm-hmm. um, be a completely different beast. Um, even more so than he is now, which is saying a lot. But yeah, Joe, man, look if he if he's on the show, if he's not wrestling, he got the segment of the night. Between his theme song and the song he writes about his opponents, that's a hit album. <laughs> the Can you, uh, Can You Please Get Fired song, fantastic. Loved it. AJ Francis is doing a lot for Joe Hendry, and I want to state that very clear. He's a great foil. Yeah. I'm just hoping that there's a, a partner coming in by way of, uh, I don't know what he's going by now, but he used to go by, of course, Ezekiel, <clears throat> or, or whatever his name was. Um, the the Wanderer, remember him with the guitar in WWE? Oh, you talking about? I know you ain't talking Elias. about Ezekiel Jackson. You talking about Elias? Got yeah, you, yeah, Elias, not, not Ezekiel Jackson. Elias, there you go. Not Big Rick. <laughs> no, not Big Rick. Um, Masha Slamovich and Alicia Edwards defeated uh, Jody Threat and Danny Luna when they had knockoff tag team titles. Uh, Spitfire can't hold on to these belts. They just lost it before, if I remember correctly. Yeah, these. Yeah, they, these bills kind of getting hold a little bit, huh? A <laughs> little bit. Now, I think the idea was to keep the belts on MK Ultra. Um, I'm sorry, it was MK Ultra who just lost the belts and then won, or won the belts and then just lost them. Because they won the belts this summer or she lost the belts in January at Hard to Kill, won them back in February, but then Killer Kelly uh, took a leave of absence from the company. Uh, and then Spitfire got the belts and held them since March. And then Alicia and Masha won the belts. So I, I have a feeling that MK Ultra was never supposed to lose the belts the second time around. But due yeah. to Killer Kelly's uh, needing to take a leave, uh, they shifted gears. Now, I'm not mad about what they're doing with this. You know, Alicia's never been a great worker, but I like her. And this is one of those times where you can say, like, yeah, she deserves this. Like, some, I don't think anyone should ever be uh, deserving of a world title run because you need that guy or girl to keep your company up. Yeah. But this belt, you can do it. You deserve a it, run, and that's what I feel like Alicia got. Yeah, I feel like we've been calling for Lil' Lish, man, for years now. She's been a great, you know, companion piece, obviously, to her real-life husband, but I'm talking about in character as well. She, that character's going through a lot with Eddie's... Uh, many uh character machinations if you will now she's kind of getting a little stride of her own i think this is honestly even you know situations like what happened with mk ultra create a lot of uh opportunity for creative uh you know some creative uh jumps if you will and i think putting her with with masha works and it's probably the perfect time to put the belt on her because it's, it's 100% believable. You could have, like, a little sneaky lish and then have Masha with the raw power and the, and the, and the, and the, the nut bag of it all. And I don't, you know, go back and watch it. But that has to be an interesting relationship, to say the least, because obviously you know the lish is going to be with the group. But Masha's never been somebody that's needed anybody but herself. So obviously they think they're going to come together when they need to. And when they're not, they're uh, going to probably be solo and that dynamic is going to be real interesting because essentially, you know, you can use Lish as like a battering ram in any scenario. But uh, at this point, what? The system got, what, 70% of the, 75% of the belts? Um, they don't have the knockouts. They don't have the digital media. They don't have the X Division. So they have half. I think there's six yeah. titles, so they have half. Yeah, gotcha. So that's good. I mean, look, they didn't even let the... um. And shout out to Elvis because they didn't even uh, let uh, Honor No More get this type of momentum. No. So, you know, I think this is working. And it's just <coughs> the four, which I think, you know, keeping it small, the right and tight like that, I just think it's working. And they're going to come out and those, you know, they're going to come out and probably do some photo shoots that look like album covers. When so, they should. 
Yeah. So I think I just think it's working. A system, the system works. <laughs> you know, pun intended. So um, I'm digging it. But I do hope, to your point, that they give them a good run with those straps because it's believable. It works, and we don't like the miracle round thing with the belts. And we just got through talking about what WWE done with their women tag titles. We don't want. That's not a trend you want to copy. You know. So. Okay, I had to take a sip of something. Um, Swan then defeats something after the uh, uh, knockout sag match. Um, something tried to get saved by Cody Deaner, and he's like, "I'm gonna make this a tag match." I don't think they they brought in Santino for the night. <laughs> so like Deaner is like kind of like the stand-in for right now, and he he pretty much cost Jake something in the match. I know where this is going, and I'm excited about it. Gresham debuted his new great Muda-inspired look against Kushida, which was the perfect opponent to do it against. And while the crowd never got into it, the crowd was bad for Under Siege. They, they need to not go to Las Vegas for, for a little while. Um, Gresham and Kushida had a nice little match, and Gresham got to showcase his new goth gimmick with, with the mask and, and the poisonous uh, ink. All that's very cool. He needs a different name, though. I don't know. It, like, the great Gresh seems too on the nose. <laughs> So you're still going by Jonathan Rush? Yeah, as of right now, at least that I'm aware of. But I think like this is a great idea to go forward with. He just needs a different name. Uh, What's octopus in Japanese? Oh, I don't know. Let's find out. Uh, English to Japanese. It is taco. Terrifying taco. Sounds more like a, a Taco Bell <laughs> Halloween meal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's, it's something around that to grab. But he can, you can work something around that because he do look like a baby Muda. He does. Um, so he, it, it's something. It, it's you know, it's interesting that this is the direction they're going. Like I said, I like it. I dig it. Obviously, it's not going to get any lack on the wrestling. So um, I think trying to differentiate himself when you got guys on the roster like a Mike Bailey, like an Alexander, like a Kazarian. And then certainly with the guns, he you know definitely wanted to stand out. So I appreciate the fact that they letting him do this, and and uh, he's obviously gonna have more creative freedom than he would in other places. And then, you know probably might have been time, he might have been getting bored uh, mm-hmm. with what he was doing. So I'm mm-hmm. um, digging, but like you said, a, a name change might be uh, necessary. But you know there's there's time to do that because this is still a developing thing. I mean, hell, we seen Rosemary felt like developed that thing from the ground up in TNA uh, when it comes to that, that that whole thing. So I still remember that whole backstory they gave us. So uh, he got time to develop, and like I said, he won't be lacking for anything in the ring. So looking forward to that. Yeah, I agree. Mm-hmm. Uh, PCO and Jordan Grace uh, defeated Steph Delander and Khan in an intergender match. This was whatever. Um, there was a cool spot, though, with Jordan Grace and Khan where Khan hits her with a Samoan drop, and on Twitter she was like, you know, I, hoping he forgot about that because there's a receipt from when she hit him with one. That's the only moment from this match that worth it, is worth anything. <laughs> uh, Mustafa, uh, Mustafa Ali defeated Ace Austin for the exhibition title. Um, sometimes I, I don't like these kinds of matches because you know he's not going to lose to Ace Austin. But it did showcase uh, Ali in a good match. Like Ali looked good. You know He moved well, had, had a pretty solid outing. I wouldn't say it's a match of the year contender or even a reason to watch the show back, but it was a good match. And if you're an Ali fan, I think you're going to really appreciate this match. I just don't yeah. much care about Ali. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just been interesting because he, you know, the thing has been getting a lot of attention and it's been working for him. Like this whole thing, particularly on the, on, on the impacts, with the weekly raffle, that whole thing's been creating mm-hmm. some very interesting, mm-hmm. interesting segments. So I think overall it brings it brought a different vibe and, and presentation with the exhibition and coming off of what what could be stated as the probably one of the greatest, if not the greatest, exhibition champion in Chris Saban. Um, it's 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 switching things up and he's being presented as far more important and relevant than he ever was elsewhere and. Uh, yeah, so it's going to be interesting seeing who they do finally get to take it off of them because I would have thought they would have tried to do something with Jake something. But like I said, they're obviously going in a different direction involving Cody Diener. So like I said, it'll be interesting. And, you know, kind of changing of the guard because a couple of years back, you couldn't keep that title off Ace Austin. So. Now, and 
There's a part of that misses the uh, that version that is awesome just a bit. <laughs> Main event time the uh, the system as I call them the moose. The system defeated Broken Matt Hardy and Speedball Mountain, who uh, adopted the names of Trent the Seven and uh, what was it? Uh, the Ball of Speed. The Ball of Speed. Uh, this was a solid outing, decent main event. Um, again, not worth going out your way to watch, but I think for what you know, Under Siege was was a TNA Plus exclusive event. So like you know, if you subscribe to it monthly, you paid no extra charge to watch it. Uh, it was good, you know, it was good. I'm not I'm not gonna put it down on any match of the year contenders that we're coming up with, but I will say that Matt Hardy looked as good in this match as he had in the last five years. Take that for what you will. <laughs> He's 50, so he's not exactly a, a, a spring chicken any longer. Sorry, he'll be 50 this year. But um, I think this was a good sign that maybe Matt has a little bit more left in the tank than we thought. And hopefully going forward we can see more of this Matt just possibly being uh, uh, not limited but um, used appropriately when necessary. You don't need to, uh, uh, you know, throw him out there constantly. Yeah, and he might even just work better than somebody. That's why I think it's so, uh, I guess the word I use is a bit titillating for the both of us in terms of potentially getting Jeff back because segments featuring Broken Matt Hardy and Willow, mm-hmm. that's, that's, that's just entertainment value on a different level. And obviously not having them go back to what they were doing years ago where they basically had to, they were the life support system for the company when it was in the, in the doldrums, but um, I think bringing it back in this way and kind of mixing things up with guys like the system, because those two elements could completely throw uh, you know, somebody like the, the system off in a, in a good way, and you could potentially blend some stuff a little bit in, in terms of having Rosemary have a pop-up little segment with them and that whole deal, that, that'd just be a great not a great entertainment value right there, so but like you said, he looked great. Um, I thought them coming out with the names and his his uh, his long coats was great. Mm-hmm. Just kind of mm-hmm. giving up to the thing, and uh, yeah, just, I just I like that uh, that that chemistry. And I think the Moose kind of took Dolph out, but not Dolph Nick. Sorry, uh, Nick. So you know, I think that still got some meat on the bone to do. And then obviously. Uh, I don't. I mean, also, I don't feel like they're gonna put the belt on Matt. They don't need to. They just need somebody to kind of be in Moose's way for the time being. And I think this could, they could get some good stretches out of this while guys like Kazarian and, and Alexander kind of waiting the wings to get back uh, to Moose. So, I would agree. All right. So All right. that'll bring us to the close of the show, unless there's anything else you wanted to mention. Uh, no, that's, that's, that's pretty much it. We already had kind of talked, yeah, we talked about The Rock with the whole uh, following WCW days, which, you know, mm-hmm. like, just kind of filling out the, you know, the seven bucks production thing. I had another thing to that belt. So, so let's hit the outro. You can find Marcus on uh, Twitter, at Paradox Kid, P-A-R-A-D-O-X-K-I-D. You can also find him on his uh, other podcast, The True Penny Show, on Twitter as well, at T-R-U-E-P-E-N-N-Y-S-H-O-W. You can find me on Twitter at Chad Nerd, NerdCorp, C-H-E-D, N-E-R-D-C-O-R-P, and I'm the intro at Chad's Photo Hut, C-H-E-D-S-P-H-R-T-O-E-T-T. The website's realnerdcorp.com, R-E-A-L-N-E-R-D-C-O-R-P.com. You can also find us on Twitter at N-E-R-D-C-O-R-P. We'll be back next week, probably Tuesday. For another edition of the Wrestling Underground Podcast, I will uh, let everyone know on Twitter. Uh, I think we'll stick with Tuesday. Um, events in my life are changing, and Tuesday is no longer a necessity, so that's kind of why I'm mentioning it now. But we'll, I think we'll stick at Tuesday. I think it'll work. Um, so we'll be back next Tuesday at 9 p.m. for another edition of the Wrestling Underground Podcast right here on Twitch.tv backslash Wrestling Underground. Uh, be sure to tune in then. Uh, until then, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for checking us out. Thanks for giving us a chance. Remember, as always, to watch more wrestling. And Marcus takes home. Good night, me.